We welcome you to West Lafayette, Indiana. It is a beautiful, blustery Saturday for football as two first-year head coaches gauge where their rebuilds are at as Purdue takes on Minnesota. And we are currently on what they call the loudest and proudest mascot in college football. Jason Benetti, Kelly Stauffer, and Boilermakers special number seven. We are just uh, cruising around Having campus here, time. taking in the sights, enjoying it uh, with our driver, Kyle. He's, a, he's done a great job so far. Uh, these two first-year head coaches, P.J. Fleck, we know about Row the Boat. Jeff Brom's slogan on the front of the media guide is, let's play football. They're different guys. And Jeff Brom plays football offensively in particular. I think he has a great opportunity to win quickly here. It's really what Joe Tiller did successfully at Purdue. A fun offense, a veteran group on defense are already playing incredibly well. P.J. Fleck, 45% of his roster right now, freshman and redshirt freshman. He told us earlier in the day they're going to be a much younger team before they're much better and so that transformation has already begun there's a quarterback situation for both teams yeah. as well and for more on that we're going to toss it uh, to oh right over there our sideline reporter chris button hi chris Thanks so much as you guys talk about the journey of the coaches both of these quarterbacks that will start today have had their own journeys we'll start first with purdue quarterback david blau led the conference last year in interceptions he's trying to change things around this year but has been hampered with injuries he suffered his second shoulder injury just two weeks ago. I talked to him this week. He says he feels about 100% and ready to give it a go today. But Jeff Brom said you will also likely see quarterback Elijah Sindelar in there as well today. As for Minnesota, Connor Rhoda was done last year. They took away his scholarship. In fact, he even participated in senior day. That was until P.J. Fleck rode his boat into town and re-offered him a scholarship. Fleck told me this week that he hadn't even seen Rhoda play a down, not even on film when he offered him a scholarship. Scholarship, Jason. That's just how bad their depth was when PJ Fleck got to Minnesota. Yeah, we've got uh, we got row the boat versus sound of the horn today. <laughs> evidently, here in West Lafayette, could you ask for a better day for you football? You really couldn't. The wind's going to matter though in the kicking game, so we'll have to keep an eye on that. It is windy out here currently. Yeah, the wind's going to matter in your hair yeah, there too a little bit. I have bit. so much hairspray on that thing. Is it moving? Uh, yikes! Minnesota, <laughs> Purdue, toe meets leather. Right after this. <laughs> Welcome to the Big Ten on ESPN, and we have made our way to Ross Aid Stadium where the Boilermakers will take on the Golden Gophers, and Purdue is wearing throwback helmets to the Joe Tiller days. 1997 to 2008, Joe Tiller was the head coach here. He passed away just a couple of weeks ago. This is the very first game at Ross Aid Stadium without Joe Tiller. You see the logo. and. Uh, Here's a guy who was so important to this program and also the Big Ten. He revolutionized the way Big Ten football was played with the spread, and he revolutionized Purdue football. Yeah, and somewhat ironically, we're in here at a really a time where we can talk about Joe Tiller as an incredible coach, and but he brought something to this university that, quite frankly, they didn't have before very often. They haven't had it since. And Jeff Brom has a chance to bring back fun again. Starts on the offensive side of the ball, and that's exactly what he's already doing here. Great Joe Tiller quote. Uh, he was talking to his wife. He said, well, dear, how many great football coaches do you think are out there? She looked at him and said, one less than you think. Oh, that is, that is so them. And this is my story about Coach Tiller. Obviously, he was the head coach at Wyoming, and we had a bitter rivalry with them. And... As I saw him in years after, he always greeted me with this, with love, damn sheep. <laughs> and remember, we're the Rams, and so coming from him, it was the one guy I could take it from. From everyone we talked to here at Purdue, he will be missed for years and years and years to come and remembered for years and years for his innovation of the game of football. With the windy day, there's a holder out there for Evans kickoff. Wind's going about 20 to 30 here at Ross Aid Stadium, south to north. Evans kicks it away, and we are underway in Big Ten game number two for both teams. And Connor Rhoda, the quarterback, will lead him out, the redshirt senior out of Creighton Durham Hall, which is a high school you may have heard of. 
a number of guys are from that school in the Minneapolis area. Paul Molitor, the Hall of Famer, the manager of the Minnesota Twins, some quarterbacks as well, including Steve Walsh, who won himself a national championship. How about Joe Maurer from the Minnesota Twins? One of the key players for that team and another quarterback that you may have heard of as well, Chris Wanky, who won the Heisman Trophy. So a long line, Connor Rhoda is the quarterback from Creighton Durham Hall in Minnesota. So he's a local product and we are underway off the toss to Rodney Smith. He is swarmed under on a loss by TJ McCollum. So Connor Rhoda, as Chris told you off the top of the show, did not have a scholarship after Tracy Clays told him in December it was being pulled. P.J. Fleck shows up, calls him, wakes him up out of bed, and says, we want you to That's be a quarterback. That's pretty extraordinary. And P.J. Fleck told us it. he never laid eyes on him, as Chris told us, but it epitomizes our task at Minnesota as we take over. That's where we have to start with guys that we haven't even laid eyes on. Rhoda to throw, he wants the left side, and it's nearly intercepted. A big collision there. Dewan Hunt, the senior defensive back, crashed into Phillip Howard. And we have a player down, the potential receiver on that particular play, and Hunt actually broke back on the ball. Rhoda led that to the sideline, and I believe it's Phillip Howard that tried to catch that football, and he was blown up by Hunt as the ball arrived. Purdue has been a big hitting team, but also has drawn a couple of targeting fouls in the last game against Michigan. So they're without Jacob Thienem in the junior safety and middle linebacker Jawan Bentley because of big hits in that second half of the Michigan game. And that's the one thing that you see out of Purdue currently that doesn't have anything to do with the exciting offense. They have a veteran experienced bunch on the defensive side and they're playing physically very, very well early in this season. They're a top 50 defense, points per game, about 21 and a half per. And in that front seven in particular, you have grown men up there that are four and five year guys. And on the back end, Hunt being one of them, they're ball hawks. Their corners are very aggressive. And you saw it on that play right there. Minnesota certainly cannot afford to lose any wide receivers. Demetrius Douglas is out for the year with a foot injury. And they're down a couple of guys in that wide receiver core, which was thin in the first place. So Howard, the redshirt freshman out of Minneapolis, is down. And this ball kind of floated on Rhoda a bit. It was a deep over route by Howard. And then Hunt was really in the deep third and broke on that ball and arrived just when the ball did. Howard sitting up, and again, yeah, Minnesota. News. Yeah, that is fantastic news. Minnesota is a heavy running team, but on second down and long, they went for Howard. And big collision. And Jeff Brum told us that that it's a heavy run team. That inside zone we we've discussed is kind of the table setter. But Jeff Brom expected Minnesota to come out and air it out a little bit early because. The safeties for Purdue defensively are nosy, and they're aggressive, and they get in the box quite often. Again, without Thiedemann in that position, Mosley, the sophomore, takes that spot, creeping up toward the line. Third down and 13 for Rhoda. Check down for Smith, and Rodney Smith veering across the 25. T.J. McCollum with his second tackle. He only got four, and it's punt time for the Gophers. And it's going to be punt time, Jason, into a very stiff wind that's coming out of the south, blowing north, the open end of the stadium. So this ball needs to be low, hard, and preferably to the sideline. Jacob Herbers will punt for Minnesota. Ryan Santoso struggled with kickoffs last week, so Herbers rolls and boots this one, and that's not going terribly far. Good field position for the Boilermakers, and no matter who plays quarterback today, it's a 
a long line of great ones here at Purdue. Gary Danielson, Len Dawson, Bob Greasy, Mark Herman, and then later on, Jim Everett, Drew Brees, Kyle Orton, Curtis Painter, over and over again, <laughs> Purdue has had wonderful quarterbacks, whether in the Tiller era or not. And they'll likely play two today. David Blau is the starter. Yeah, David Blau goes out there now. And remember this about him. He led the Big Ten Conference in pass yards a year ago and led the nation in interceptions. That's kind of what you get right now. He's off to a fantastic start through four games this season. Blau, quick set and throw. Terry Wright. Trying to break a tackle after an 11-yard punt. Tremendous field position for a Purdue offense that likely will go short passes to build the confidence of Blau. Yeah, that's a that's a great point. And they will go fast. When they get in rhythm, they want to go as fast as they can. Offensive football is fun under new head coach Jeff Brom, just like it was under Joe Tiller years ago right here in this place. More innovation coming from the Purdue offensive factory as face mask flags fly everywhere. Knox got turned around and draws a couple of markers. Looked like Gary Moore was the guilty party. Personal foul, face mask, defense, number 19, 15-yard penalty, automatic first down. Well, Gary Moore will have to sign in in the penalty sheet with a 15-yarder that time. Yeah, this is uh, about as bad as a face mask gets. A lot of times those defensive linemen, which Gary Moore is, you grab anything you can when you see the runner go by, but it looks brutal when you grab the face mask. Top 25 penalized team, least penalties, P.J. Flex, Golden Gophers, but they're a big one. Blau to throw off play action. Goes sideline. Touchdown. Cole Herdman, the tight end out of Leesburg, Virginia, scores it. And quite frankly, it could have been one of two receivers. Cole Herdman, the tight end, is a very good receiving tight end. Four touchdown passes on the year and or catches, and he was wide open. That was a completely blown coverage. There was also a wide receiver at the back of the end zone that didn't have anybody on him. The hardest decision on that play was which open guy was Blau going to throw it to. And flags off the extra point. Extra points have been an issue. Kicking has been an issue for Purdue. And Jason, what we're going to see out of Purdue in particular is the use of their tight ends. They're still trying to find speed at the wide receiver position, but Cole Herdman, what we saw on that play, all of his catches, eight coming into this game, have been for first downs. And combined with his, his colleague Hopkins at that tight end position, they have 20 receptions. Most of them, 14 have gone for first downs. They've alternated kickers. You'll see both Spencer Evans and J.D. Dellinger likely, as that one's no good. Back to the drawing board, special teams-wise. But David Blau, the quarterback, withstands pressure, takes a lick, and gets it out to Herdman, the tight end. The Boilermakers are on the board first. Taco Bell is a proud partner of the college football playoff. Be on the lookout for Taco Bell student sections and passionate fans like these at games all season long. Some chancy special teams so far today from West Lafayette with an 11-yard punt from Minnesota and a missed extra point for Purdue. The Gophers will have it off of that touchdown to the tight end Herdman for the Boilermakers. And Spencer Evans who's been a touchback machine kicking off for Purdue. 17 out of 23 have been touchbacks so far this year, including his first today. Another long one to the end zone and a touchback. Kelly, you scour tape every week. So what, I ask you, is the Minnesota playbook stuffed with or stopped with? If you nice, will. I like that. 
Minnesota sets the table with the inside zone run that's based on a box count. If we have six or less, it's favorable to run. This time, there's a seventh added late, and they actually get caught. More guys at the point of attack that we can block. Very fortunate that here that it ended up a positive run, but it's all based on the box count. Six or more favorable, seven or more, we're going to have to throw the football. So we're going to see a lot of inside zone today. No doubt about it. Connor Rota back out. Smith the tailback inside for a couple of yards second down coming up so what do you do against it well when people load the box as Purdue's going to do with their safeties you bring a seventh guy down so it means run pass option the quarterback has to pull it and make that safety pay for getting nosy throw the route in behind him and that's exactly what we're going to see out of Rota right here the run pass option core is inside zone run pass option could come off of that inside zone well, right here, Purdue looks like it's bringing heat. On second down and eight. They will go inside, and Purdue lights it up. Garrett Hudson in for Bentley with a targeting penalty. Third down coming up as we check in with Chris. You guys were talking about Connor Rhoda's story and getting his scholarship pulled. I talked to him this week, and he said, you know, even though I was looking at other schools, I was looking at possible medical sales options. I had a feeling that something, that my time at Minnesota wasn't done. And when P.J. Fleck got hired, he was going to go into his office and prove himself of why he should be here. He didn't have to. Fleck called him first. Hey, he's psychic, evidently. That is an awesome story. It's a psychic boat that he rose. Third down for Rona. Free runner coming, and that's going to be about a yard short of the marker. Marcus Bailey with the hit on the tight end, Lingen. So fourth down after an 11-yard punt. What are you going to do? Interesting decision. Remember, you're punting into about a 20-mile-an-hour win that didn't work well last time, although you don't really like the offensive line's ability to get a push. So I think P.J. Fleck is going to roll the dice or row the boat right here to try to extend this drive. Shannon Brooks is the running back. They're going to do it out of the shotgun on fourth down. They're four for four on fourth down this year. They do run it, and they do get it. Shannon Brooks, the junior from north of Atlanta, moves the sticks. And that's one thing that P.J. Fleck knows that he's going to have to kind of flip is the offensive line, and particularly the depth. They're getting guys up front. They kind of have a mixed bag. They have some graduate transfers and some young guys that are playing really the first time this year. And the continuity up front right now is not great. They've moved the redshirt freshman Connor Olson over to center. Vincent Calhoun, the senior at right guard with the injury to Jared Weiler. Rhoda trying to elude pressure, throws it to the Purdue sideline. And second down on the way. And that was one of those run pass options right there. And sometimes you can basically, it turns into a play action. You take the run element out of it. But it was going to be a wheel route and a post route. And Purdue wasn't fooled on the back end. Let me ask you, how much fatigue mentally is there with the inside zone concept? We had Georgia Tech last week, and there was a lot of fatigue there. Yeah, that's the thing that you, as a defense, know that you have to understand. Georgia Tech, it's the fullback. Right here, it's the inside zone, and you see Purdue loading the box to destroy that play. Smith turns it upfield to the 40. McCollum and Hunt together after a gain of five, and it's third down for Minnesota. But remember, the, the stepping stone is the pass game that comes off of the inside zone, Jason. And so you want favorable numbers in the box, which is six or less. If you see on your screen seven or more in the box, Rhoda, the quarterback, ought to be throwing to somebody. The problem is those perimeter playmakers haven't really clarified themselves yet. Tyler Johnson, who's been a key target, is man-to-man -man on the near side at the bottom of your screen. He's got 15 catches this year. Rhoda looks the other way, gives ground, and flips it out incomplete. Mosley got a hand on it, and it's fourth down. And Rhoda needs to not give ground like you alluded to, Jason. He needs to set his feet 
wait for guys to be open and throw the football. As you drift as a quarterback, a lot of times you don't get a lot on the ball, and Rhoda doesn't have a strong arm to begin with. Minnesota, Kelly, has changed punters now. Santoso, who'd been the punter for the year, is in for Herbers, who kicked at 11 yards last time. There's a flag down. This is a wobbler that goes spinning to the 25-yard line. We'll check the marker. Well, if this is on Minnesota, I certainly make them punt this football again. It's been an adventure already in two tries. See what Ron Snodgrass has to say. Five players in the backfield, offense, five-yard penalty, be enforced by the end of the kick, first down, timeout. They're going to go ahead and take the kick and tack on the five after it. Purdue football after this. ESPN College Football, brought to you by Liberty Mutual Insurance. Liberty stands with you. 20,000 square foot weight room in the new football facility. It's such a big facility and weight room, they needed a drone to capture it. As Terry Wright has this grab from Blau, who's been an 80% passer in the first half this year, and that's mostly been the first quarter for the junior who spoke it. Big Ten football media day about football and life and some of the hiccups that he's faced, including leading the league, as you said, in turnovers last year. He fessed up to it in front of all the coaches. Markel Jones back from injury with flags flying in. Kamal Martin to stop, and we'll check the marker. Personal foul. Flipping. Offense, number 75. 15-yard penalty. Repeat second down. It's on the Northern Illinois transfer, Shane Evans. But, Kelly, I want to ask you, say you're Blau and Sindelar, and you're playing a quarter each. How does that affect you? You know, if it's a quarter, you still, as a quarterback, I think, have time to get a feel for the game and and get kind of in a rhythm. Because quarterbacks have to see it well, right? And we've, we've been in situations where we've seen them switch every play, and that makes no sense. But this seems to be working well for both of these guys currently. Blau to the outside, Jared Sparks, the red shirt freshman. And for more on David Blau, here's Chris. Yeah, well, we talked about the idea of him being a captain and would he be able to do that when he wasn't in the game. And they say his leadership style hasn't changed. When we talked to Coach Brom yesterday, this is something he's used to. He was in a two-quarterback system when he was at Louisville. And then when he was an assistant coach at Louisville, he coached his brother, who also was in a two-quarterback system as well. Yeah, he made Brian do it. Just for good measure. That one's intercepted. Blau picked off. Kunle Ayinde, the red shirt senior, ripped it off. Well, Jason, you talked about how good Blau has been in the first half. 80%, three touchdowns. That's his first interception in the first half, and that was just simply a bad decision. It was completely covered over the middle of the field, you have to go to your secondary outlet or th simply throw the ball away. And when we talked to P.J. Fleck this week, he said, if we don't get turnovers, we're not going to win games. No shot. They got one early here today. While Purdue had the wind, by the way, which may become a factor as the game wears on. Tremendous field position, and they will go jet sweep with the tailback. Brooks, who was lined up as a receiver, and he gets mauled behind the line. What happened with Allende's pick? I, I just don't think that the quarterback Blau saw it early. 
I mean, I think that was the biggest thing. Lined up in the slot, and then he's just going to work to the center of the field, and the middle linebacker doesn't go anywhere, and the defender over top of him initially squeezes him down. That was a closed door from the get-go, and the quarterback, Blau, has the experience where he needed to diagnose that better. Brooks has a seam. Shannon Brooks inside the 15. And just out of bounds before the goal line. Blackman nudged him out. First and goal, Minnesota. And Shannon Brooks is more of the big play guy. His problem is staying healthy. You have Rodney Smith also that is more of the physical pounder, but it's Shannon Smith that has that knack for turning a five or six yarder into a 15 to 25 yarder, and we saw it right there. That was his longest of the year, Brooks, a 40 yard gain. And he gets the carry. He is swung down by Hudson, the reserve inside linebacker, in for the targeting suspended Bentley, second and goal. And Jason, for Minnesota up front, the zone running scheme is a fill thing that has to do with the continuity up front by the offensive lineman in conjunction with the running back feeling it. And you can see a little better of job up front in this game than I saw on tape coming into this one. That's good news early for Minnesota trying to pound it in. Smith, hesitation. Smith goes down. Ball came loose. And we'll see if they say he's down. TJ Jallo busted in to make the stop. And no signal yet. It will be third down. How about the run defense for Purdue here? And it's nothing new for Purdue down inside tight. Inside the five, they had two great goal line stands against Louisville and Lamar Jackson the first week of the season. It's very close to a fumble. Third down and goal for Rhoda. The senior fading back, throws it goal line. Touchdown! Ty Johnson just got in. Tyler Johnson's running what they call a Q route. He comes inside if he's going to continue across the field, and then he turns back outside. Wasn't very well thrown, but the bottom line is you got to put it on Johnson to give him a chance, and that's exactly what happened there. And Rhoda made a nice play, kept the play alive to some extent, but the ball came out on time, and it worked out well for him right there. Carpenter's extra point is good. Shannon Brooks, a 40-yard run to wrap on the door. The Purdue's defense nearly got the stop, but the pressure from Hudson didn't get there in time. Johnson, the score, 7-6 Minnesota. Seven six, your score, Minnesota with the lead over Purdue on the Ty Johnson touchdown, his third touchdown catch of the year. They do get points off the interception from Allende. And Ross 8 Stadium, Kel, was a sellout. Last time they were here against Michigan, first time in about a decade they sold the place out, but I, I, that speaks to what Joe Tiller did here, just rebuilding exactly this right. program. That's exactly right, and he gave the fans something to be excited about. The style of play, I think, was significant. The innovation on the offensive side, daring to bring the gun spread past happy offense into this conference? Are you kidding me? And then it worked. He had the right players at the right time and coached them up, developed. All of those things work well. And by the way, it'll still work for Jeff Braun. You feel like this program's in a little bit of a similar situation as in 97 when Tiller first got here, don't you? A lot of similarities. There's a bouncer and they flip it to DJ Knox. 
They'll get across the 25, and that's it. Michigan State and Michigan, that's all you got to say about tonight's game. 7.30 Eastern, 4.30 Pacific on ABC, also streaming live on the ESPN app. Everybody's going to try to hold on to the long snaps in the game, especially late. We'll find out how it plays. Michigan night games all time has had some success. But Michigan State kind of has that ability to have their the chip on their shoulder and all the younger brother stuff, and their defense is playing very well at the right time. Knox finds a crease and gets about five yards on a first down carry. How about Penn State earlier laying the wood on Northwestern? Yeah, I think Penn State is uh, rolling. I think they're yeah. I don't I don't think they need a wake up call. It helps to turn around and hand it to Barkley. He he is a man child, and my my vote for the Heisman at about a third of the way through this season. Blau to throw on second down, down the middle, looks for the tight end, and is it complete is the question. Minnesota says no. Purdue says yes, and Herdman did make the grab. How about the big body tight end going down and getting a ball that wasn't well thrown by Plow? A lot of times with quarterbacks, you have a rule of thumb. On big body guys, running backs, tight ends, I need to put it on them, but Herdman goes down and gets that one off the carpet. And whistles with the snap. They're going to take a further look at that. Catch, no catch. Rolling on the field was a completed catch. Plays under further review. Yeah, Minnesota initially, a couple of Golden Gopher players waved it off, thinking that it hit the ground. So well, they're we on the see. defensive side. What, what do you think they're going to say? Yeah, but they were vehement, right? They didn't just kind of... No, leisurely. are you saying they can't <laughs> be deceitful vehemently? I think that might have been right. I think that kind of snuck through. Yeah, yeah. that's incomplete. No I catch. Yeah. Th that's why they were vehement. Yeah. But they are deceitful over there, too. Those <laughs> guys can be that way. You You're know just that. saying defenders in general as a former quarterback. Everyone on that side of the ball. That's kind of in their makeup. So what happens Part of their if you're disposition. A, if you're a two-way player, then? You just lose the deceit when you come back to the offensive side from oh, your vantage point or what? Yes, you have to check it at the door. You have to be honest and straightforward. <laughs> we'll see if that 20-yard catch for Herdman, which would be his fifth of 20 or more on the year, see if it stands, likely won't. And I think that is a theme, though. We're going to see the tight ends because the wide receivers for Purdue are still developing, and Jeff Brom told us that that he's still looking for those guys out there, specifically more speed. Herdman and Hopkins both are very productive. They have 20 catches. 12 of them have gone for first downs. They have now five touchdowns on the year at that position. You're going to see it today. If you think about what Jeff Brom did at Western Kentucky, though, there was a lot of big play, splash play type stuff. Yeah, I think that's a cornerstone of his offense. Gadget plays anywhere, anytime. And splash plays. They don't look to drive the ball. They look to go fast, but they want chunks in there somewhere. Here's a guy who ran a gadget play on the first play of the game against Michigan and then the first play of the third quarter against Michigan. So the playbook is terribly deep, and, and we talked to Richie Worship, the running back, about that, and he said, look, he installs things on day one. We're expected to know the last week of the season. So there's an acuity and an <laughs> intelligence to what Jeff Brom does that pushes these offensive players. Yeah, it's in them. You know, they kind of they kind of dream about that stuff. Those great offensive and defensive minds. We're resetting at the 410. After review, the ball hit the ground in the process of a catch. It is an incomplete pass. It's third down at the 31 yard line. Please reset the game clock to four minutes, 10 seconds. 410. Thank you. You know, Jason, that's a part of this wind that we haven't talked about. You know, what effect does that have on the ball? It isn't just when the wind's at the side and it can push the ball a little bit. When it's behind you, a lot of times as a quarterback, the ball will kind of take off. So you over adjust. And that time, I think the quarterback plow just threw that ball a little bit too low and threw it into the ground. You think that happened on the interception? I think it could have been. But the interception to me was more about a really, really bad idea. Blau on third down. He can run, and he does run. 
Near midfield, first down, David Blau. Cashman ushered him out after a gain of 18. This should have been the decision on the interception, quite frankly, Jason. It, if nobody is there, the third decision a lot of times is to run the football. And that's Plow worked through his progression. No one's there. Make something happen with your feet. As David Blau did for a first down just short of midfield. Play action. He saw the pressure coming. He hits Sparks, who turns it upfield and gets leveled at the 45-yard line by Celestine. And Purdue is a is a zone running team as well, but they almost always tie it to their RPO, their run pass option. It's almost always a two-way decision for Plow post-snap like it was on that play. DJ Knox withstands a tackle and picks up the first down. It took Thomas Barber to drop him, but that's a muscular run for five. And now you feel kind of the rhythm of this drive already. And Purdue will try to go a little bit faster, multiple personnel groupings, and a lot of time movement with that. So Thomas Barber on that tackle, the brother of Marion Barber the third. Father played here, running back at Minnesota as well. And a couple of hard counts early to get more pre-snap intel. It wasn't just one hard count, the second one came as well. What do you gain? I think you just gain a look whether they're going to bring pressure or not from the defensive side, which they do. They got a real good look at that pressure. Barber came blitzing and sacks Blau. Well, maybe next time they need to go with three hard counts because <laughs> two didn't give them enough information. That was just a blown assignment to the left side. The offensive line didn't adjust to that stunt. You're going to see the defender is going to come right between the guard and the tackle, and they just whip. One guy's going inside where you actually have a, def a defender that has three guys blocking him. Obviously, that was a missed assignment by Shane Evans. Pressure coming again. Blau steps up and he airmailed it. That might be the win you were talking exactly. about. Exactly. The deep throws in particular, you you saw that where it kind of drives it when it gets up in the wind, not unlike a punt would or a kick would. The pass does the same thing, and that's a pass that you would like to drive, but it's so far downfield, you get it up in the wind, and that thing takes off on you. How can you practice for this scenario? It, you, you just literally have to throw into the wind, and obviously you can't orchestrate that on a daily basis, well, but you have to have experience in it. If anybody could, it would be the engineers here at Purdue. Blau to throw, third and forever, check down for Knox. A lot of space for Knox across the 35, and he's going to be close enough to go for it. Well, especially with the adventure that their kick game has been, I think Purdue will go for it right here. You have the wind at your back, so room is not a problem. I think it's a matter of not having confidence in that part of the game currently for Jeff Braun. What's your play call? Get it out wide again. You have four receivers in the game, a single back, you just play in space, and the quarterback, Blau, just has to make a nice decision. He's going to have an open guy. It's a matter of finding it. Jet sweep. Jackson Anthrop. First down, the legacy Boilermaker on the run to move the sticks. The fly sweep motion, and you turn around and hand it to him. A lot of times, Purdue will use that motion and never hand it off. In a critical situation where you haven't done it yet in this game, you turn and give it to him. That was a great play call. His brother Danny, a four-year football player. Brother Drew, a basketball player here. Father was a basketball player at Purdue as well. They roll the pocket with Blau. More room to run. Wide open space for Blau inside the 15. And he got hit late. It draws a marker, rightfully so. Celestine with a damaging blow to Blau. After the play, personal foul, late hit out of bounds, defense, number 13, half the distance to the goal, automatic first down. Jason, this is when I think David Blau is at his best. When he runs with the football and I don't know, that was close. It looked like Blau still had a foot in. I think that was a questionable call with the late hit at the end. But it was a great decision by the quarterback before that. And that's why the interceptions are down, because he's making better decisions and creating things with his feet. 
Worship the tail back in motion. Blau wanted to run, and he loses a lot of room. Celestine, who just had the penalty, whips him down. Second and goal, Purdue. So you like Blau out in the open there. I do, because it represents a great decision. When you're dropped back as a quarterback to throw the football and you end up running it on time, it typically is exactly the right decision, and Blau's done that twice now in passing situations. Eric Swingler, the tackle, has checked in eligible, and he's plowing forward for worship, the tailback. We'll have third down and goal for Purdue. A couple of first-year coaches try to get their first Big Ten win, 7-6 after Time one. out on the field. You may think they're best friends, but the ESPN app is a fan's best friend. Every ESPN and ABC college football game live at home or on the go. Scores, news, highlights all season long. Download the ESPN app to start streaming now. A lot of great games earlier. Clemson remains unbeaten with the victory over Wake Forest. And here, third down and goal for Purdue against Minnesota. And Purdue still perfect in the red zone this year. In nine trips, actually. Goal to go, eight touchdowns, one field goal. That's pretty good. Play number 13 of the drive. Blau into coverage, intercepted. His second pick. This one's Kamal Martin, and there was no window for Blau. Cole Herndon going to the back of the end zone. The tight end just releases and gets upfield but he was doubled, actually might have been tripled. This is a great example of a quarterback just simply getting locked in. It was actually Hopkins, the tight end, number 89, getting locked in on a guy. Now there's a design of the play, and he's a primary receiver, but as a quarterback, you have to make the decision. That doesn't mean the guy's gonna be open, and that was a really poor choice. Take points right off the board for Plow. Before that in the red zone, Blau was 13 out of 14 with five touchdowns this year. That is a hurtful pick. Shannon Brooks, another big hit for Minnesota. First down, Gophers, as we check in with Chris Cotter. Well, that's a Maryland team that just beat Minnesota last time out. And these are two teams right here kind of trying to find their way. And neither coach really wants to lean on the record in year one. But this would be a nice push it in the right direction sort of victory. Smith, the tailback, jockeying through traffic. He could go. Rodney Smith down the sideline. Keeps his feet and goes twirling inside the 15-yard line. Oh, these two running backs, Smith and Brooks, this one for 51. And one of the staples of the zone run is always to have the vision to get out the back door if a defense over-pursues, and that's exactly what Rodney Smith did on this play. If you over-pursue on the backside, a running back that has the speed and the eyes to get him there is going to make you pay and Smith there. How about Rhoda going from Minneapolis <laughs> to New York <laughs> City for that block? All the way downfield. Goal to go for Minnesota. This one is bottled up with Brooks. Shannon Brooks, whose mother was in and out of jail when he was growing up, basically was assisted in raising him by a local middle school teacher and what an impressive young man Brooks is after everything he's been through. And this is a great situation that Minnesota has. I think the strength of their offense right now is certainly their running back position with Rodney Smith and Shannon Brooks and they're best friends and they don't mind sharing touches and trust me that doesn't always work in in various locker rooms. You saying that you had to share reps with somebody you hated? No, I've had to share the locker room with running backs that hated it. <laughs> Timeout. Timeout. Minnesota. By Minnesota. Timeout on the field. We'll hear more about Kelly's locker room vengeance. You've got to learn to share. 7 6 your score is second and goal after this.
Well, we told you the inside zone is a staple for Minnesota, and the running backs have been very good early on. Yeah, both running backs have had a really big run, but that's also part of the inside zone scheme. The defense gets tired of being doubled on the line of scrimmage. Linebackers get tired of being reached, and they get over-aggressive, or over aggressive and they pursue over top of the ball, and you get those big cutback lanes, and we've seen Minnesota get there. Second and goal out of the timeout. Rhoda with an option for Brooks, seeking the pylon. He was out of bounds, short of the goal line. It's going to be third and goal. McCollum and Bailey, the linebackers, together to knock him out. That was a new little wrinkle, the speed option. Just attack the end man on the line of scrimmage, and if he jumps up field to get the quarterback, you make a simple pitch, and that's exactly what happened on that play. Rhoda's running the offense really well, really efficiently, and that's really his role. He's a game manager and just make great decisions. He's always been in charge. Quarterback, point guard, catcher, pitcher in high school. All of those guys make great decisions. Play action. Rhoda stared down the blitz and throws a dagger to Lingen for the touchdown. Jason, when we talk about the inside zone being their core, what we've also seen is what comes off of the inside zone. The big cutback runs that we've seen for 126 yards today. And, and then that, the tight end, Linga, is a blocker on the end, end of the line of scrimmage in that zone. Play action pass, he sneaks to the back of the end zone. Both of those are byproducts of the inside zone. He was staring down the barrel of heat as well. Roto with the touchdown, but again, the running game lays the foundation offensively for Minnesota and P.J. Flex. So the long run leads to the touchdown for Lingen, and the Gophers are back in the lead. There's a guy with the touchdown, the tight end Lingen with the score for Minnesota, take a 14-6 lead. Well, Lingen is in that zone running scheme that we've talked about. In this case, he's gonna act like he's blocking Bailey, one of those linebackers that gets tired of being reached by those blockers, and then he just slips to the back of the end zone. That's a byproduct of that core play, which is the inside zone running scheme for Minnesota. The most resistance for the Gophers so far has come from the wind, which is why Santoso needs a holder. Wind really gusting between 20 and 30 today at ross Aid Stadium. Santoso gets a good leg into it for a touchback. Chris Cotter. Chris, thank you. New quarterback for Purdue, Elijah Sindelar, who usually takes the second quarter, is in after three drives, went touchdown, interception, interception for Blau. He's got Markel Jones back from injury behind him, so an all-new tandem there as Sindelar throws into the lawn, second and 10. Chris Button. Yeah, Jason, after Blau's second interception, obviously frustrated, came to the sidelines, and Jeff Brown went up to him to talk about what he was seeing. He thought a defender was going to drop off, and, brought, and Coach is telling him, you need to relax. He was telling us yesterday, when you use two quarterbacks, you got to help them in their confidence whenever they screw up like they did. Yeah, that's an interception he would like to have back, certainly, and there's that rub play that Purdue likes to run. Terry right over the middle, third down. Yeah, and I think Chris is right. I, I mean, the plow is pressing. There isn't any doubt about that. And it's not what you think the defender's going to do. You have to see him do it before you let the ball go. And that's exactly what Plow was not doing on those two picks. 
How about Sindelar? He has to come in in the second quarter. He's going against the wind. Yeah, and that's going to certainly affect his throws, and we've already seen that. That one to the sideline went into dirt early. Jones finds a crease and a first down for the Boilermakers, just short of the 40-yard line, gain of eight. And Sindelar is a different body type. He's 6'4", 230, compared to Plow's 6'1", just over 200 pounds, and a much bigger arm. And so you can, as a play caller, get to different places on the field with Sindelar pulling the trigger. He's the deep ball guy if there is one for Purdue. We were talking to Jeff Brom about that, and he said he'll call them with both, but if there's one of the two he'd rather go deep with, it would be Sindelar. This is a screen for Terry Wright, who surges across midfield, ball loose, and we'll see who comes up with it. Barber knocked it out. Minnesota is pointing gopher ball. Let's see. And Wright is still down on the ground and appears to be hurt. The question is whether he had a knee down before this ball came out. The officials are taught to let it play out. Don't blow the ball dead. Minnesota came up with it immediately after the play, which is also significant. But I certainly think this is going to be reviewed. We'll see if it is Minnesota ball. Wright had it knocked out by Barber. Kelly, that's going to be very close. I, I would say from that first look we had, he's down before the ball was dislodged. Wow. Again, we're starting with the call on the field, which was fumbled. So there would have to be indisputable video evidence that he was down prior to the fumble. You'd need that amount of evidence to overturn the call. What's your takeaway after seeing it a couple times? I think there's enough evidence to overturn that. And say he's down. Yeah, I think that left knee was down before you could really see that ball coming out. And that word, indisputable, is always the key. Well, and this would be big for Purdue's confidence as well. As Jeff Brom said, this is a team that sometimes still doesn't necessarily feel like it's going to win games. They're 9-39 and, nine and 39 last four years, and you lose this one, which they might. Yeah, and I look at this last look here, and I think that ball is moving, which may be enough to keep it as it was called on the field. I, it's so hard, and that's why we need to always keep these things in mind when the replay booth is is taking a look. The guys on the field are calling it real time, and they are taught to do what they did. Let it go. It gives you more options Throwing on the, the back end. The fumble is confirmed. There was no clear recovery at the end. of Minnesota recovers out of the pile. First down, Minnesota. Well, I think that was a misspeak by Ron Snodgrass. He said there was no clear recovery, and Minnesota came out of the pile. Minnesota did recover. Right. So there was a clear recovery. Right. Or we couldn't have given the ball, given to, Minnesota. The ball to Minnesota. Third straight turnover for Purdue, no matter the semantics of it. And now the officials are going to talk it over again, and that I, may be part of the issue. I think the verbiage is going to be questioned. It isn't a matter of who comes out of the huddle with it. Was it recovered in the immediate action after the fumble? That's what we're looking for. If there wasn't a clear recovery, then you can't give it to that team. And that, I think, is what Jeff Robb's saying. Uh, he's in XFL mode right now. Yeah. Talking to the wanna, officials. We probably don't want a mic on that conversation. We've not had an official further explanation. Here's Snodgrass. Replay official ruling on the field of a fumble will be further reviewed. Ruling of a fumble is under further review. Okay, so now it's under further review, which is further than the further review from the previous. I think that's furtherest. I, th I think that's what we're looking for. I it's think the furtherest so. review. Which which is ideally where you get the first time. But this is an important play for the Boilermakers. Again, Jeff Brom is in his first year with this team. 
they haven't turned it over a great deal those first four weeks of the season but if you give it away a few times like three straight possessions as we told you then you start to get the feeling of mm -hmm. oh boy here we go again yes. these guys and, didn't know how to win he said and that is the primary thing that most coaches that come in under adverse situations i.e. the previous guy was fired that's what they have to protect against right is they have to change that because when the heat is on everyone starts looking around saying when is something go going to go poorly for us right and so you're right Purdue's in the in the midst of responding to a touchdown drive by Minnesota and they do not want to give this ball back I mean they can also review the recovery of the ball here on the back end of the play Mike Mendez the offensive lineman was in that scrum and looked like he might have plucked the ball at the back end of this play as you take a look at it you can decide for yourself but uh, that's very difficult to overturn as well to have a clear recovery again you would need indisputable video evidence of the clear recovery in a pile like that after review the ball was loose before the runner's knee was down it is a fumble first down Minnesota I thought that's what we had already learned but we've learned it twice now and Minnesota will have the ball no matter what yeah I I'm not on board with the way that was handled to be perfectly honest we concluded that it was a fumble it's about the immediacy of the recovery that I thought was in question if you're Minnesota you go for a big play here with the wind at your back you probably could do just that and remember the safeties for Purdue like to stick their nose in the run game like we're seeing right here and they're without one of them Thieneman due to the targeting suspension Smith shirked one tackle but not the rest of them and no gain second down and 10 Antoine Miles busted in and so Purdue's defense needs a response in this sudden change situation and that's what you're referring to kind of the sudden change which I don't think is real sudden anymore because everyone does it <laughs> and so I think offenses are doing it less but the theory was when you have a sudden change a turnover defense runs out there they're not prepared and you go for the you go for the throat and Minnesota elected not to right there this is a much improved Purdue defense 117th last year Rhoda to throw and it's incomplete will there be a marker Bailey on Wozniak and third down coming up Let's check in with Chris Cotter Always a fun one, Navy and Air Force. The option attacks going at it. Third down for Minnesota. Redshirt senior Rhoda with Miles bearing down on him. Rhoda steps out of bounds, and a nice job by Jalen Robinson, the son of big dog Glenn Robinson, to not go after the penalty. He had a good job of understanding that Rhoda, that's really his second read right there when he tries to make something happen with his feet. In the end, there wasn't anything to be done. Rhoda makes a good decision and doesn't throw into coverage, and they should be able to punt this and flip the field, field position-wise. Santoso with the wind at his back. Sends it up into the jet stream. Anthrop lets it bounce. It checks up. Minnesota gets down there at the one-yard line. 54 yards on the punt. Eric Timeout Carter the touched it up. Purdue way back there after this. And coverage is streaming live on the ESPN app. Download now and take ESPN everywhere. You got to have the ESPN app for the 330 window. Games galore going on as Purdue trails Minnesota 14 to 6 and the Boilermakers have to go 99 yards Purdue though does have a touchdown drive of 96 and 97 this year Sindelar back in after taking over second quarter they run with Jones 
And not much there. Chris, what do you have on the weather downstairs? Well, I'm about 15 yards from the line of scrimmage, and the problem with this wind is that it's not consistent here at field level. It really just picks up out of nowhere. So for these quarterbacks that are trying to determine when throwing into the wind, when it just comes out of the blue, it's really hard to keep up with. And that may not be the only weather issue, the gale forest winds, because rain is on its way to West Lafayette. Sindelar on the screen, has a first down for Anthony Mahungu down the sideline and just short of midfield. First down, Purdue out of their own end zone. Gain of 39. Really a one-man tunnel screen. Grant Hermans, the left tackle, gets out there, gets a great block, and it turns into a very productive play. Well executed on the single-man tunnel. That's a pretty good screen. I'm going to send him back. Stepped out of bounds at the 43 for Mahungu, the Parisian senior, born in Paris. Family still over there. And a whistle before the snap. Timeout, Golden Gophers. Timeout, Minnesota. They're second. Purdue driving against the wind, trailing by eight. Out of the P.J. Fleck timeout, 14 to six Minnesota. Anthony Bahungu with a long run down the sideline off the tunnel screen, but he was a little further back than he had planned, as you see. Foot clearly out of bounds at the 43. But still, the longest play of his career. Sindelar is hit, and down he goes. Ball loose. Batted around. Is it another Purdue turnover? Jackson knocked it away. Merrick Jackson. And it is Minnesota football. Andrew Stelter, the recovery. It's exactly what P.J. Flick told us. If they don't win the turnover battle, they don't win games right Going now. Going on the field, a fumble recovered by the defense. First down, Minnesota. I think that ball is clearly out. There isn't any doubt about that. And again, we get back to, was there an immediate recovery? But what they had going on, did Purdue outside, was, was a game on the screen game. They were running a double move outside. It was well covered, and... Sindelar just needs to learn that if we don't get him on a play that's somewhat of a gadget, that ball has to come out. Remember what P.J. Fleck told, told us? He wants his linemen and his defenders to have a fascination with the football and yeah. bring him the ball. They do that in practice on turnovers. He loves getting energy up about turnovers, and we saw it there. Rodney Smith running parallel and belted out of bounds at the 33. So Dewan Hunt knocked him out of bounds. This is a thin Purdue secondary with the suspension for Jacob Thieneman off the targeting penalty against Michigan in the second half. And Jeff Brom said, look, we just have to be smarter tackling-wise, losing both Thieneman and Bentley, who are getting loose at the football facility as we speak, likely, with a TV in front of them watching the game. Play action for Rhoda. Pocket holds up this time, and a diving grab inside the 20-yard line. Brandon Lingen went horizontal for 15 yards. Remember, that's a 6'5", 254-pound guy. Very well thrown by Rhoda, and the 6'5", tight end goes down and appears to make a great catch. He got underneath it. So first down, Minnesota. Rhoda clapping for it and finally gets it. Brooks puts his head down as we check in with Chris Cotter.
Brooks this time bottled up. Nothing there. Lorenzo Neal, the son of the former NFL fullback with the tackle. Third down on the way. And this is typically where you have to use your imagination with Minnesota finishing drives because the inside zone has been productive out in the field with big plays, but finishing drives when you don't have the perimeter speed guys and you don't have the continuity up front where you can just pound someone to get the ball in the end zone. Typically, it's play action pass to try to make something happen. They've got the running back Smith in motion and he wasn't lined up properly. It's a timeout, timeout. Minnesota. Minnesota. Good use of a timeout third, because there was something timeout. that was not right. Smith, the running back, was wide to the right side. Then he came racing to the other side of the formation. And then he stood and looked back at the quarterback, which doesn't give you the feeling of comfort either. So a good use of the timeout by Minnesota. Well, points off turnovers for Minnesota, regardless of how this ends, have been huge. 31 entering today, 14 this afternoon, and try to build on that off the fumble by Sindelar. And that's the the template right now for P.J. Flick trying to get this program going again, changing the culture, flipping the roster to resemble what you guys want, in particular up front. And it, we talked about it time and time again, the inside zone run, and then everything else is set off of that. Third down and two for the Gophers. Brooks hopping through, pushing the pile. Rhoda says first down, and it looks like he's very close. Robinson stopped him at the eight, but that's all he needed. And that's a good sign for Minnesota up front. It's not really the all-out consistency right now that you're going to get, but can you be effective in times like this, third and two, deep in the red zone, can you get a push and get a good measurement and continue this drive? Well, Minnesota doesn't mind taking the air out of the ball at eighth in time of possession in the FBS coming into today, and we'll see if they do pick up the first down. They do. First down, Minnesota. And Jason, you might see the air come out even more now. I mean, you get it into the end zone any way you can, but they wouldn't mind this taking a couple more minutes and leaving Purdue with a shorter amount of time before this first half ends. Under six to go, first half. Minnesota's won four straight in this series. Some close games in recent memory. Here's that option again. Rhoda turns it upfield, lost the ball. And let's see, did Purdue get it back? Oh, it's a disaster for Minnesota on the way in. Ezechuku knocked it free. Mosley recovered for Purdue. And that's the second time we've seen this play deep in the red zone by Minnesota. It's the option where they just go quick to the in man on the line of scrimmage. Rhoda made a good decision initially, but then didn't protect the ball as Purdue had it well defended. Is he down? That certainly is going to be the question Purdue, right now. Sideline warning. Side warning Purdue. That's the least of anybody's worries right now. Well, there was initially a flag on the field, but the official hustled over and stuck it in his pocket. This certainly is being looked at, and I don't know. It looks like, once again, it's knee down before the ball starts to move. The ball doesn't have to be completely out, and it was called a fumble on the field. Of a fumble recovered by wow, the defense close. is under further review. Well, Tom Fiedler, our replay official, is going to get paid time and a half and then some today. Been a busy afternoon at Ross Age and Stadium. They've had some tough ones. They have. I mean, kind of some bang bang. There's a knee down before the ball's not out necessarily, but is it moving? 
on its way out. And then you can have your own conversation at home about what indisputable video evidence is, but what you need to know is the call on the field was a fumble, so they'd need to have that evidence to overturn it. And that word almost always wins. You know what I mean? It is almost always the deciding factor. And Rhoda had it initially, and then... That was Mosley jumped Mosley. in. Mosley. And that it's a free-for-all at that point. There's some things that go on at the bottom Every of the pile. Year, that ruling on the field stands first down. Yeah, stands first down, and that's what you hear a lot. That's where indisputable video evidence wins when you get the stands. There just isn't anything to overturn it. That was Danny Ezechuku, the senior with the forced fumble. Make a note beside that turnover. When you don't get anything, when three is the worst you can do, and Minnesota coughs it up, and Purdue now has the ball. Could have been a two-score game. Is not. Quick hit for Anthrop, turning it upfield to the 15. Turnovers galore in this game, by the way. Boilers just got one back, but uh, four turnovers last 22 plays is not a good number. No, it really isn't. You don't want to see that. And Minnesota will needs to live on turnovers and certainly not turning the ball over themselves. Let's check in with Chris Button. Jamarcus Shepard, the wide receivers coach for Purdue, pulled everyone over for the offense and said, I want you to do your one job. Don't think about five plays ago. Don't think about five plays from now. And then Jeff Brom came over. He said, if we're not going to hold on to the football, we might as well not even be out here right now. I agree with Jeff Brom. <laughs> Very innovative mind, but sometimes it's terribly simple as well. Quick hitter goes nowhere for Jones. Barber danced down with him, so second down and nine. And we talked to maybe five or six offensive coordinators last year, just yeah. canvassing college football, and we said, who do you like to watch? Many answers of Jeff Brom when oh, he was yeah. at Western Kentucky. The cutting edge. There isn't any doubt about that. I... I would agree with that myself. And it was only a matter of time before he moved up to this level. We'll see if he can get it done in the Big Ten. Sindelar rolling out, wanted to uncork, and now he takes a dive. So third down on the way. But Jeff Brom, he's a former XFL player. He's a former NFL quarterback. He's also a former Cleveland Indians draft pick. In the fourth round in 1990, played on the same team as Jim Tomey before retiring from baseball after two years. Well, I think he made a good choice. I Apparently, think so too. what position did he play? He was, was he an a outfielder. He was an outfielder. He could obviously throw it. Yeah, you don't want to run on Jeff Brom out there at center. Sindelar lets it rip, nearly intercepted. Huff had the last hand on it as Phillips had it pinball around. So, very, punt time. Excuse me, Jason. Very well thrown by Sindelar. Actually, a little bit off platform. They moved the pocket a little bit, put on Phillips. Exactly right, and the double catch gave the defensive back time to break it up. Off platform, meaning what? His feet weren't right. He was moving to his right a little bit, and sometimes quarterbacks have to do that. They don't get to set their feet, but very well right, thrown by Sindelar nonetheless. You go underneath that. First punt for Joe Shopper comes into the wind, and that's a pretty good punt into the wind. Fair caught by Chenault as we check in with Chris Cotter. How about Matt Campbell, the former Go Mount on. Union guy at Iowa State? We saw that starting to show up when we were in there. They lost a heartbreaker to their in-state rival, Iowa, but he's a sharp cat. You talked about Jeff Rom. Matt Campbell is right in that mix. There goes Rhoda, and he's down at the 45. Eddie Wilson with the tackle. That was with a new quarterback as well for Iowa State. Wow, today. that is unbelievable. And the, the other side of that story is we simply do not know who the college football playoff people are yet. There's a lot to be seen, and we're going to have people dropping just like Oklahoma did there. Still some time for more of that to happen today with Michigan State and Michigan coming up later on. 
Minnesota out of timeouts and unbothered by that fact for now. Blitz coming. Rhoda throws into it and has a completion for Rodney Smith into plus territory and a first down. And well thrown. He went to the right guy, and Smith it went, ran a wheel route up the sideline, but it was the type of throw that was needed. Couldn't float it at all because the safety was getting over top and would have blown that one up, but he drove it and got it to Smith on time. Golden Gophers top 10 in the nation in time of possession, down to two and a half, first half. Smith straight ahead, and the Gopher is willing to take some time off the clock. And I wonder what, how long it's going to be before Rhoda keeps that and gets outside. The edge rushers for Purdue are simply not paying attention to the quarterback. And when the quarterback boots outside, he's taught to look for that very thing. Did anyone have you or did they not? And you give the quarterback or the play caller, you know, a report, and they come back and run that sooner than later. 22 runs, 10 passes. First half for Minnesota. As you said, their core play is that inside zone. We've seen it a bunch. Rhoda to throw, launching with the wind at his back, and incomplete Mosley on the coverage of Lingen, and it's third down. Great play by Mosley. Outside linebacker running with a very good receiving tight end in Lingen, and that was well defended. Hit him, I think, right in the back of the head. This could have easily been pass interference because he doesn't turn and look back for the ball. No pass interference called, which I think was the right call. There was a little bit of contact, but I think you have to let him play on that one. That's a 19-year-old safety, Mosley, against the senior tight end, Lingen. Third down. Purdue rushes four. To the outside, and Smith. And he is gang-tackled at the 39. So if you're Purdue, do you call timeouts here or no? I think you do. I think that's who Jeff Brom is. But I, at the same time I say that, Jeff Brom doesn't have all the pieces in place that he wants. And so I think at Western Michigan a year ago, he would want to get all of the guns out. I mean, all the bullets out of the gun. But here, I don't think you do. Yeah, Jeff Brom with those three Conference USA offenses that you really couldn't stop back-to-back championships at Western Kentucky and maybe a year, two years down the road he burns a timeout here? Every second, no doubt about it. Here comes the flag for delay. Delay game. Offense. Five-yard penalty. Right, Purdue has declined the option of a 10-second runoff. Fourth down. Sorry about that, Ron. Uh, let's take a look at this week's AP rankings brought to you by PlayStation, Alabama, Texas A&M, 715 Eastern. Who you got? Alabama. You by thought a, about it, though. By a bunch. I was actually looking at something else when you threw me that <laughs> question. I wasn't paying attention. Alabama and Clemson are way above everyone else on that list. Penn State may be a close third, but there's a lot of sorting out to be done. That is a bad choice by Anthrop. Why touch the ball there? You're Red well shirt, inside. Freshman. You're well inside the ten. It's those decisions that just drive Jeff Brom crazy. You're inside the ten, and the wind is blowing twenty to thirty miles an hour. All of that has disaster written all over it. And by the way, that's not a legal fair catch signal either, because he only waved the one time. Yep. You have to have multiple waves above the shoulders. That didn't happen there. No flag, but where could they have gone anyway? They're at the they would have gone yard back, line. They would have gone back to the one, right? <laughs> half a, half the distance. But now anything, a bobbled snap, anything like that puts you in harm's way for no reason. Knocks the tail back, and he is charged with getting some yardage here. He thought about spinning it outside, now goes up the middle on what very well may be the final play of the first half. 
Week 5 NFL Sunday, 10 a.m. Eastern on ESPN. Sam Ponder and the whole Sunday NFL countdown crew have all the breaking stories and injury updates live on the ESPN app as well. Purdue is going to run another play, and it's Knox. Don't necessarily know what the value is there either, unless you bust it. And them. Um, looked like Minnesota was going to use one, and they yeah. don't have any left. Do they... Or they probably would have. Kind of a disjointed the first, first half. half. I'm out on the field. And that's going to do it for the first half. Two first year coaches who are looking more at culture than results. 14 to 6. As we go to the Dave and Buster's halftime report after the break with Chris Cotter. And on ESPN. And after one half, two teams seeking their first Big Ten wins for their first year coaches, P.J. Flank and Jeff Brom, and it's 14-6. to six. Minnesota with the lead. Purdue, though, will have the ball out of halftime. Jason Benetti, Kelly Stauffer, Chris Budden along with you. And for P.J. Fleck, the first-year oarsman for Minnesota, he's got to be happy with the turnover situation so far. Yeah, he taking the ball away but they didn't get a lot of points but Purdue has to feel very good about themselves in the sense that we can spit the bit four times and only be down by eight that's a pretty good thing that was a really out of sync first half I was in sync with you but the game <laughs> on the field wasn't really a thing of beauty no and it may get worse Chris Button's gonna let us know in moments exactly what the weather's like in the future but here's a hint They've closed the south end zone patio because of high winds here at Ross Aid Stadium. And that's why there's once again a holder for Santoso, who tees it up to begin a half number two. Knox from the 10. DJ Knox with a seam to the outside and out of bounds as we check in with Chris Button. Well, Jeff Brom stating the obvious when I talked to him, we had to take care of the football. So I asked him, how do you coach against that in the second half? And he kind of laughed and said, you know, I don't know because it hasn't been a problem for us so far this season. He did tell me Elijah Sindelar will start the second half. And I hate to be the bearer of bad well, news, but as you can tell by my hair blowing everywhere, the weather is about to come in. They're expecting the winds to get up to 35 miles an hour. Here is a look at the radar. They weren't expecting this storm wow. to come in until about 630, but it is moving faster than they expected. They're expecting the winds and the lightning to come in so bad that they've actually told all the tailgaters to take all their tents down. Wow. And, and Chris, you know that Purdue is a pass-happy team. And if the weather turns bad, that's why I think Purdue needed to get off to a much better start in that first half. Good field position for Sindelar after the 15-yard personal foul penalty that gets him up just short of midfield. So 23-yard return, 15-yard penalty, and knocking on the door at the halfway mark. Sindelar to throw on his first play, a check down for Jones and an open field tackle after a gain of one. Jones spun down by Antonio Chenault, the junior out of Roselle, Indiana, and Lake Park High School, Roselle, Illinois, in second down. You know, Jason, we talk about Purdue throwing the ball all the time, but in their two wins, they rushed for 468 yards, and their two losses to Louisville and Michigan, they only rushed for 81. So. It's big play rushing and then passing when defenses try to load the box. A run for Jones with a big gap and chopped down by Huff right at the marker. So it looks like a Purdue first down. And Minnesota up to this point in the game, Jason, have been content with playing six in the box to defend the run and playing the pass with five. And Purdue hasn't been successful against that. Well, the fumbles have been a major problem along with the interceptions so far for the Boilermakers who only punted once in the first half. So it is Jacob Huff who's down. He was the one with the tackle. And that's a place where Huge. Minnesota just cannot afford injuries. Antoine Winfield Jr., 
a hamstring injury not playing today. Duke McGee, the other starting safety, suspended for not doing the right things, as P.J. Fleck said during the week. And that's one thing he told us. Look, we're, we're not going to compromise moving forward with something like a suspension if you're not doing it the right way for a program. The culture is more important than anything in what he calls year zero. Yeah, you have no choice but to make those decisions if you want it to stick. Laying the foundation is about making some of those tough decisions. He told us, quite frankly, some of our best players aren't with us currently. At some point, you're going to get evaluated for wins and losses. But for both these coaches, there's a grace period. Yeah, and it's about three years. <laughs> and, <laughs> and you need to win a whole bunch of games before that time. And right now, you're right. It's laying the foundation, bringing your culture in, and trying to get the players as soon as you can on your roster. Sindelar for Sparks. And the freshman turns it upfield, just short of the line to gain. It'll be second down and two, tripped up by Martin. And that really can be, as they say, an extension of the run game. And we've talked about true rushes. Purdue wasn't very consistent in that first half, and in their two losses, they weren't consistent at running the ball. But that's really the run game. It's a it's a very, very high percentage screen, and then you just get it to a playmaker and let him get yards. Jones could not keep his feet, so third down and one for Purdue. Both teams are really using the short passing game as an extension of the run game. Who takes the first big shot, do you think? You know, this wind is kind of... I think dictate that it's hard to throw deep when it's at your back and it's almost impossible to throw deep when you're going into it so we may be seeing the pass game 20 yards and shorter to here this afternoon Jones straight up the middle inviting contact with Celestine and he won Jones did first down my goodness Markel Jones is a physical running back and as Minnesota's coaches told us that that whole group of running backs for Purdue typically fall forward, and it's called finishing runs, and Purdue does a great job of that. Eighty-eighth in the country in rushing offense coming in with some slow games, although close games, as Sindelar whips it for Zico, and he couldn't hang on. Chenault on the coverage, second down. Run pass option. I think a good decision to pull it and not give it to the running back in a very well-thrown ball, and Seco just couldn't finish. Chenault was there, but he was at the back side of the receiver, thrown very well and should have been caught by Seco. Elijah Sindelar, the sophomore out of Princeton, Kentucky. He played in some mop-up duty last year, five games as a reserve, and he hands it off this time. Third down coming up, Carter Coughlin got in there on Jones, so now third and long for a Purdue offense that hasn't taken many deep shots. And see, it's that second down run that doesn't happen well that puts you in third and long, and that's what Purdue did well in their two victories. They were able to run it productively when they wanted to, and then it opens up that pass game. Purdue has really, really struggled on third down this year. 31% for the season. Sindelar, shovel pass. Great call. Markel Jones to the 15-yard line. There's the ingenuity from Braum. Defensive end, Blake Cashman, 36, runs upfield, and then you just essentially invite that edge rusher in and shovel it underneath. And you're right. For play callers, the best ones in the business, it's a feel thing. Some of it you can anticipate, and that was great anticipation right there by Jeff Braun. He learned from Bill Walsh, among others, in his 49er days. Sindelar. Runs right into the pressure from Carter Coughlin, who had one play off, and his return is a big one. Coughlin got around Steinmetz on that, plays the right tackle position, and just kind of a hard rush around the inch. No real move. He just ran the rail, as they say, Carter Coughlin, and got around the big offensive tackle. Second down. And long. This has meant screen game for Purdue up to this point in time. Sindelar rolling the pocket. 
Dumps it off for Knox. Upfield he goes. Touchdown, DJ Knox. He is the one who knocks. 22 yards. And Sindelar did a great job of getting through his progression. It was a smash route out to the right side, a corner route. A receiver sitting in the flat, and then DJ Knox is the outlet receiver and really late from his running back position. You could literally hear him clapping his hands up here in the booth. We caught it on the microphone. A great heads up to his quarterback, and his quarterback found him for the touchdown. Purdue will not chase points. Dellinger to kick, and it's a one-point game with a lot of time remaining. The Boilermakers are back on the board. DJ knocks the score, and it's a one-point game. Fourteen, thirteen. Your score in a close one. Two first-year head coaches, PJ Fleck and Jeff Brom. Jason Benetti, Kelly Stauffer, along with you. And look, you're going to have uneven games, right, when you're in your first year as a head coach. And I think that's one of the big challenges. You know, there are going to be ups and downs, turnovers in the first half. Purdue looks great when they hang on to the football. Minnesota may not have capitalized on enough of those takeaways in that first half. How do you go about it in the second half if you're in your first year building a program? What do you say? You know, this weather actually, interestingly enough, may have a lot to say about it because I think Purdue wants to put the ball in the air, but you can't throw the ball if the ball's wet, typically. Purdue needs to run the ball, and their two loss or their two wins, they ran it effectively. Minnesota is more grinded out type of team. They want to be physical at the line of scrimmage. Once again, a touchback as we take a look at our Pacific Life game summary. And if you like turnovers, you came to the right place. This is the place for you, right? And it really came in a variety of ways. I think Blau made some really poor decisions in the pass game, no doubt about it, and in the red zone as well. 14 points off of turnovers, and they came in all varieties. And Purdue put the ball on the ground a couple of times. But they did just get in on the DJ Knox touchdown from Sindelar. So 14 to 13 as Connor Rhoda goes back to the steering wheel for Minnesota. Redshirt senior who thought he was done. He had senior day last year. He's got more in him. He throws for the sideline very close. Ty Johnson was there, and he does reel it in for a Minnesota first down. Very good late decision to get this ball to Johnson. Does he get his feet down? I think, yes, he does. That was very well done. Johnson actually was the third receiver earlier on that crossing route, but Johnson found him, or Johnson was found way late on the sideline by Rhoda. Former high school basketball player Johnson with great hands. Smith weaving his way through traffic for a nice gain on first down to the 42. Bailey the tackle, second down coming up. So with Minnesota offensively, remember you, you basically have a, a box count to start with. We want to run against six or less. We want to typically get it to the perimeter on seven or more, and sometimes Purdue will try to add the seventh defender into the box late to mess with the quarterback, Rhoda. Purdue has added defenders here in the second half. Thieneman, the safety, and Bentley, who's in on that tackle. Jawan Bentley, who was suspended for the first half with a targeting penalty against Michigan, hits him for a loss of three. And Bentley is one of the most physical middle linebackers that you will see in the country. 6'2", 260, and he's active. He's a ball hawk, and he's going to make up for the first half, at least try to here in this second half. This would have been his 30th career start. He'll have to wait for that. Third down, seven. Four-man rush. Rhoda feels it, gets out of the pocket. Ezechuku couldn't make the tackle, and Rhoda is out of bounds. Fourth down, Minnesota. Good job by Rhoda getting 
away from that early edge pressure by Bailey. The outside linebacker coming off the edge. He felled it to his backside and was able to escape, but nothing open downfield. Ryan Santoso to punt to Anthrop, who made the odd decision to end the first half. This one fading back, and he's down at the 24. Purdue will have it there when we come back. A trip on the Boilermakers special after this. Time for a backstage pass, and we go up close and personal, very close actually, with the Boilermakers special, the Victorian era mascot, an inanimate mascot, unless you have two good drivers at the wheel, which we did. This is number seven of the Boilermakers special. It drives to every road game, with the exception of the Rose Bowl, and we were lounging on it. Uh, Brett Milliken of Evansville, Indiana, and Kyle Hanna of Alexandria, Virginia, part of the Reamer Club here at uh, Purdue were the ones toting us around campus. So thank you very much to Brett and Kyle. And uh, Kelly, you were uh, you were really lounging there. As you see the Boilermaker was, Extra Special. I was waving like a queen of a parade or something. Looked like you were on a backlot tour. That one's incomplete. Too high for Anthrop. Second down. Do you have a history as a drum major? or I don't know where that, that came from. I have no idea. People were waving, so I waved back. That's kind of what we do back in the Midwest, I guess. Let's get you a baton. By the way, we still are in the Midwest. There, oh, yeah, that's right. It's an expansive we, that part That thing goes of the 75 mile an hour down the highway. There's no way in the world. Isn't that amazing? Here's another trick play from Purdue. Anthrop to the 31 yard line and it was Mahungu, it was Anthrop at the end. There were a couple touches for the quarterback as well. They ran trick plays on the first play of the first half and the first play of the third quarter against Michigan to varying degrees of success. That play looked like it had potential. It looked like Anthrop had a wall outside and I don't know that that wall did a very good jo job of sorting out the defenders from Minnesota. Sindelar, the sophomore, over the middle. That was a line drive caught by Herdman. Great hands by the junior tight end out of Virginia to reel that in at close range. Big tight ends can bail out bad throws sometimes, and here's an example of it. Herman actually has to reach back for this ball. Very poorly thrown by Blau on that play. Flea Flicker again, Sindelar loads it up, down the field at the 35-yard line, Jared Sparks. What a catch for 24 to enliven the crowd. And I said Blau on that last play, obviously it was Sindelar, and that was a pretty decent throw. Defended outside, but the catch was absolutely stellar. Two sixteen through the air for Purdue. Jet sweep. Greg Phillips knocked down on a nice play in space by Huff. The deep over route on that previous catch by Jared Sparks was a great again. catch, but the throw was well placed also. Look the at the field. traffic out front, and that defender from the flat is leaking back on that over route. So Sparks did a great job of going up and snatching that football. Sindelar steps up, throws it all the way across the field. Phillips breaks a tackle. And he is to the 15. There is a flag down at the point where Sindelar threw the ball. It's a gain of 15 if it stands. This may be Shane Evans, the left guard, getting called for this hold. Holding. Holding. Offense. Number 75. 10-yard penalty. Second down. So many times... Those holding plays come when the play's extended. And the reason that happens is because the, the pass rusher takes a path. And the lineman, in this case Shane Evans, engages with that defensive lineman. And when your quarterback moves a little bit or the play's extended, that defensive rusher ends up getting 
getting off his path and finding the quarterback, and the offensive lineman does not know that and just hangs on to anything he can. So they lose 25 yards on the penalty, and they lose more there as Carter Coughlin has had a whale of a third quarter. How about this call here? Third down and a long ways to go. Well, we know uh, Jeff Brom is innovative. It's going to take something innovative right here. Sindelar, third down throw. Pocket collapsed. He felt that it. it's incomplete on the short hop as Steven Richardson came barreling in to make the hit on Sindelar. And Jason, I've seen this more than once. Sindelar's a bigger quarterback, 6'4", 230, relatively inexperienced. And when he has to make a sudden throw, that was like his fourth receiver. And you don't set your feet well. That's why the ball goes in the dirt. And that's what happened right there. Jeff Brom is lighting up. Elijah Sindelar on the sideline. Former Which, quarterbacks don't like bad throws any more than the current quarterback does. Yeah, the standards are pretty high over yeah. on the sideline for the quarterback position. Shopper to Chenault, and beautifully covered by Purdue. Malcolm Dotson got down there to shove it out of the end zone, and Sparks covered it. Wonderful special teams for the Boilermakers, one-point game. Number one, Alabama against 4-1 and one, Texas A&M at College Station. Alabama, 50-point wins back-to-back -back weeks against SEC competition. Watch it on ESPN or stream it live on the ESPN app. And A&M coached by Kevin Sumlin, who is part of the Joe Tiller coaching tree. And Tiller just passed away a couple weeks ago. I know you have great reverence for the man and what he did. Minnesota on first down. Rhoda from the end zone, uncorks for Johnson, and incomplete. What do you think it was that made Joe Tiller so successful for his time from 97 to 08 here? You know, I think it was the right time for Joe Tiller to be here. I think that there were a handful of things. I think style or the fit to begin with. He was 50 years old before he was a head coach. And by the time he got here, he was ready to be, you know, kind of handle the fire of this conference and the innovation offensively. And... And I think the style offensively, coupled with the fact that he was willing to do something defensively, those two things went together. I think there are a handful of things that can be duplicated again by Jeff Brom. Why reinvent the wheel? Joe Tiller made it happen here in a big way. He spread out the Big Ten, certainly. Coaches had to notice his third down's coming up after the carry by Smith. And we were talking to Tom Schott the sports information director a long time here at Purdue and he said one of the great innovative things that Joe Tiller did was move guys around to the position they belonged at like Matt Light who was a tight end turned him into a great offensive lineman. He was a slow tight end and might become a Hall of Fame offensive tackle and that's the kind of stuff he moved quarterbacks to linebacker he moved quarterbacks to safety and that's really the recruiting template you're not going to get all the five stars here so you have to be innovative with that kind of thing had a great eye for personnel. On third and nine, Minnesota is staring down, punting into the win. McCollum got to Smith, and here comes fourth down. I think that last call right there by, by Minnesota was a little interesting. I think it shows a couple of things. Not a great deal of confidence in throwing the football right now for Minnesota offensively. And then what can you get done throwing into this win that is picking up as we speak? Santoso to Anthrop, and that bounces the wrong way for the Gophers as a flag comes in. In fact, two are down at the 10-yard line. So we'll see where this is going. Could go from bad to worse for the Gophers leading by a point. The interesting thing is, is if this is on Minnesota, if you're Purdue, even though you get great field position, do you make them punt it again and potentially have a disastrous punt backed right. up? Holding, receiving team, Ooh. number 55, 10-yard penalty from the end of the kick, first down. So it goes against Purdue, and don't forget, the Mitchell Trubisky era begins in Chicago. They're very excited about it, very, very excited. 
Week 5 Monday Night Football Vikings and Bears at Soldier Field. Coverage starts with Monday Night Countdown served by Applebee's at 6 Eastern on ESPN. Also available in Spanish on ESPN 2. Join John and Coach Gruden for the Trubisky era beginning. I think Chicago would be happy with any kind of offensive era beginning. <laughs> I think Whoever right. does it. Sindelar back in at quarterback. Jones to his right. Best field position for the Boilermakers in a long while. And Jones was sent back by the immediate pressure from the defensive line and Richardson. It was Barber with the tackle, but Richardson yeah. was in the backfield. And you're exactly right. He made the play, and that's his job is the three technique. It's to create disruption and penetration, and he absolutely bubbled that run game to the outside, and then he had people chasing it from the inside out. That's the way you play the three technique position, which simply means you're typically shaded over the guard somewhere. Here's a guy with three sacks the last couple years against Purdue, Richardson, as this is Jones tripped up back at the 40 as we check in with Chris Button. How's the weather? A little bit of the calm before the storm. About the northwest side, you start to see those dark clouds coming through. And then for a brief couple of minutes, really the wind had died down. Still not very uh, windy currently, but that's probably about to change. That was a little ominous. Sorry, Chris. <laughs> Thanks for that report, Chris. Stay safe. We can down see there. that off to the left of our booth. There's any question. Something is moving in rapidly. Third down and ten. Jones on the delay. Oh, what a big play by Kamal Martin. There was daylight. And that third down run call at third and ten may be because you were going to try to go for it on fourth, but I think we're going to try this kicking adventure what again once again and Markel Jones had daylight there if he just picks up his feet Purdue alternates kickers Dellinger and Evans kick by kick but Evans has the longer leg so he gets the call from 52 with the wind at his back whatever wind is left as Chris said for the lead for the Boilermakers Evans no good. So 14-13, it remains. Allstate is proud to be part of the team that comes together to do good by contributing to participating universities' general scholarship funds for each field goal and extra point kick. To date, Allstate has contributed millions in scholarship funds. Could have been more with the make. Purdue certainly would have taken it. Instead, Minnesota has decent field position. Evans had the what for in distance, but he didn't have the therefore, I think. It nope. was pulled from the beginning. How do you tease out the what for from the therefore? I, I just explained it to you. He had the distance. He <laughs> just didn't have the accuracy. That's the therefore part. I see. Brooks on the run. And we go to the what two for from Chris Cotter. Chris knew what I was talking about. The what for there for. Uh huh. You can use that the next time we have a field goal situation happen, and I'll see if you can get it right. I don't steal other people's stuff. It's good stuff. <laughs> Brooks the tailback on second down for Minnesota. It is Brooks rummaging toward the line to gain, Chris Button. Uh, well, I don't have the what for, but I got the why for. Jeff Brom just went up to Dellinger and said, you have the leg. Quit worrying about where the wind is coming from and just kick it through the uprights. It's a kicking game that has not been great for Purdue so far, whether it's Evans or anybody, as Brooks has the first down on a gain of four, and Minnesota willing to sap out the clock all year long. That's who Minnesota is. There isn't any doubt. They, they want to control the game through the line of scrimmage, particularly the inside zone that we've talked about all day long, and then from that, it sets the table to their pass game. Will they run a play is the question. Answer pending. No, no, no. 
McCrary in a tailback, and he thunders up the middle for about a yard. Minnesota and Purdue neck and neck, but the winner very soon may be the weather. We shall find out. Big Ten game number two trying to hold off the clouds. Fourteen, thirteen, your score after three quarters, and the Boilermakers have had four possessions end in Minnesota territory today that haven't produced points. Opportunities gone by the wayside all day. Second down and nine for Smith, and the offense. Rhoda's only thrown it 14 times, but has not made any mistakes, really. And that's the key, because he's not going to throw it a lot in this offense. But when he does, it needs to be, first of all, good decisions, like you said, and he hasn't had the egregious mistake. And it's not a real powerful pass game at this point in time either, and that's not really the point. Set the table with the inside zone, and be productive when you do pass it. Look, you said we we're going to see it all over the tape of this game. You saw it previous weeks. It's been here again. Third down. Rhoda, incomplete. Johnson intended. He misfired. Fourth down. And that was a three-deep zone and just nowhere to throw it in. Marcus Bailey from his outside linebacker position did a great job of reacting back and getting underneath that route. There was nowhere to go with that ball, and so I think it was widely thrown wide out of bounds. How about Nick Holt, the defensive coordinator for Purdue, told us along with his defensive end, Danny Ezechuku, that he likes to hold some stuff back for the second half, not as a counter punch, but just to have something exotic for late in the game as this punt goes sailing toward the end zone and in. Huge game tonight in the Big Ten. Number seven, Michigan at the Big House for the first time against Michigan State since that punt snafu. 7.30 Eastern, 4.30 Pacific on ABC. It is just around the corner, also streaming live on the ESPN app. Jim Harbaugh doesn't like the visitors' locker room here very much, but he likes the start for his team so far. I guarantee he likes the locker room at the big house. Did you see his uh, jackknife off the high diving board today on game day? Oh, just glorious. He had his clothes on, which was a good thing, but it was actually a pretty decent effort on the jackknife. He can do everything. Some say Sindelar, who's been in since the fourth drive, hits Phillips, who was decked by the freshman Thomas. What do you think of the Sindelar choice instead of Blau? I think Blau just was kind of having that, that appearance that he was reverting back to last year when he led the nation in, in interceptions. There's the positive, but then those negatives start to show up, and there really isn't any upside anymore. DJ Knox, who had the most recent touchdown, as a first down this time, and remember what Chris said about the nerves down there that Brom saw from Blau. Yeah, and that's not a good look. And the quarterback that's the head coach now, Jeff Brom, knows that look in the eye of a quarterback that he has on his team, and that's what I saw. He was forcing balls that you haven't seen him force on tape coming into this game. Sindelar finds himself some time and nearly had it picked off. Allende would have had his second interception of the game. I think Purdue is moving the pocket once again and getting Sindelar outside to the right. And we talked about that throw off the platform when his feet aren't set. And this ball just drifted on him into the wind. And that easily could have been picked off, but wasn't finished defensively by Minnesota. How do you change that? The feet. A lot of times on the when you move the pocket, your feet aren't going to be set. It's more of a matter of following through and learning that you're going to have to throw off platform. Anthrop on the screen with a convoy. Anthrop on the run inside the 30. 
Allende dragged him down after 35. Purdue is never very far away from some kind of a screen game. It replaces the run game multiple times. And this is just a now screen. You get the blockers in place. And then you get Anthrop being able to square his shoulders to the defense. And then it's just essentially a punt return. And Anthrop is very good at that. The legacy Boilermaker, his brother, a former football player. Other brother played basketball. Dad did too. Phillips on the outside was down before the 20-yard line. Kamal Martin with the stop. And Sindelar and Blau, it's been Sindelar for most of the afternoon. Defensive player. As Thomas is down and draws a whistle. Yeah, and I... If you go back to what Jeff Brom said, in camp, Sindelar was actually performing probably better than the two of them. And then Blau actually got his shoulder dinged up a little bit in a scrimmage. Sindelar started the first two games, which he probably was going to start anyway, it sounded like to me. But Blau has been really effective through this part of the season. Coming into today, he six touchdown passes, two interceptions, great decisions, been unbelievable in the red zone so you don't like to look in that first half we'll step aside with the injury to Thomas one point game not long from now number one Alabama against four and one Texas A&M at College Station Crimson Tide defense only allowed three points in two conference games this year you can watch it on ESPN or stream it live on the ESPN app Purdue with Knox. DJ Knox and a flag is in. It's a first down, but it may come back. That was an incredible jump cut by Knox, but this may be Shane Evans on the Holding. hold again. Offense, number 75, 10 yard penalty, second down. It is. And that was really to the play side originally, and then Knox's jump cut took him clear back to the left. That's a handful up front by Richardson, the defensive tackle, 96, and then Jackson, 93. In the middle of the screen, you can see 75 with the hole. Those two defensive tackles for Minnesota are a handful. They're active, and they do get penetration. Second time Purdue's lost a first down in the red zone off a holding penalty. Knox again gets it back and more to the 10-yard line. In the first half, the run game for Purdue was pretty much non-existent. Knox has actually added a little bit of juice in the second half to that run game, and Gregory Phillips doing a great job blocking downfield the wide receiver. 25 yards that time for Knox. First and goal. Knox tripped up. Barber, the tackle, second and goal. Remember, Purdue has been absolutely lights out in the red zone, finishing not only with points, but 73% of the time coming into this season, they finish with touchdowns, and sindelar has been about as effective as David Blau has been. Knox, who had the touchdown against Minnesota a couple of years ago, out for Jones this time. Sindelar, the throw, and he missed Anthrop. Third and goal. And that was all about timing. It was the fake up inside, and then Anthrop was just running a speed cut outside from his slot position, and that we could see from where we were sitting was errant from the beginning. Third down. Field goal is no guarantee on a windy day. Jones, outside, stopped. Chenault and Richardson, fourth and goal. What's your choice? Well, I can already see the field goal team coming on, and I think that's the right decision 
to take the potentially take the lead in this game. I think the only hesitation is that you're not real sound at the kicking position right now. It's Dellinger who gets the call from 19. Chopper holds for the lead. Good. That was a confident kick by J.D. Dellinger. Spencer missed earlier on the really long one and pulled it left. But Dellinger struck this one. It's kind of like stepping up to a putt. And you can't back away, and he hit that one strong right down Broadway. For the Purdue Boilermakers, who had the lead over Michigan at halftime two weeks ago, they take the lead, but those clouds are very ominous, and with lightning on its way, Time we'll out see on how the long field. this continues. We are in a weather delay. Please evacuate. And there is the delay. Ladies and gentlemen, we have not heard this from Queens. Your weather has entered into the vicinity of Ross Gates Media. So with lightning close enough to the stadium to pause the game at 9.58 in the fourth quarter, that's where we are. With every strike of lightning within an eight-mile radius, there is another 30-minute delay. So that is the clock we are on at this moment. We'll update you when we have more on the weather. For now, Chris Cotter will take it away. Purdue 16 to 14 in a weather delay. Chris? For an hour and a half rain delay, we are just about ready to go for football again as Purdue has taken the lead just recently with a field goal over Minnesota, 16 to 14. Jason Benetti, Kelly Stauffer, Chris Button down on the sideline. And here's how we got here. It's been a turnover fest for Purdue. Minnesota created a couple early on. And early on, it was bad decision making by David Blau and a couple of balls that he directly threw into coverage and one of them took points right off the board and on the other side of the ball Con Connor Rhoda did a very nice job on those two turnovers at getting points but it was great field position but Purdue got it going as we started this second half and they ended up kicking a field goal by the kicker of the day was JD Dellinger and now it's 16-14. Here's our Pacific Life game summary, and the key right now is the weather delay, an hour and a half. You said it, Rhoda hadn't made mistakes. He had the one fumble. Sindelar 17 for 24, and uh, this field is not in great condition. Chris Button's down there. We're going to ask Chris how that is after the opening kickoff, after the delay, but uh, you're going to get a look at some uh, replace your divot moments yeah, as we go on. On the natural grass and the up until the delay, the weather problem was the wind. It was 20 to 30 strong coming out of the south, and now it's going to be about footing. So off the Dellinger field goal, Purdue has retaken the lead after being up only 6-0. Evans strikes it. Brooks is back. From the goal line. Not much there, just across the 15-yard line, down at the 17. Chris Button. Yeah, Jason, as you said, this is natural grass, and I walked around, and there are some significant divots, especially in the middle of the field. I talked to both coaches. Jeff Brom telling me this does affect their play calling a lot. They'll have to run the ball, some short passes, some sideline stuff. But he said, you know what, we haven't been able to throw the deep ball anyways, so that's not really a concern. Interesting point for P.J. Fleck. He told me they brought their own air conditioning units. I said, why? He said, two weeks ago, Jim Harbaugh complained, and when he complains, we listen. <laughs> How about that? Jim Harbaugh driving the adjustments for other visiting teams. Brooks on the carry. They've used him as a wide receiver on that fly sweep action, gate of five. And How about Brooke, Harbaugh? Yeah, I'm surprised that P.J. Flick would actually listen listen, and admit that he listened to <laughs> Harbaugh, quite frankly. That's surprising. I think that'll be the first and maybe last time Coach actually does that. Second down, five. 
Connor Rhoda to Smith on the handoff. And Smith seeking that first down marker, driving the pile. He does have the first down as Thieneman made the stop, but this heavy running team goes right back there with the junior Rodney Smith. And even carries. 13 carries a piece, and they both carried it once in after this delay. And that's the core, remember, of what Minnesota wants to do. They don't necessarily have the horses up front to do it consistently well, but they need to get something out of that inside zone running game. Minnesota off the loss to Maryland last weekend. It's first loss of the year. Rota play action. Long ball. And this is almost intercepted by Thieneman. There is a flag down. He well overshot Ty Johnson. There might be a holding penalty as Johnson came out of his break. Holding defense, number 27, 10-yard penalty. Automatic first down. It's on the other safety, Mosley. And when Johnson came out of his break, I think Mosley grabbed him. I think Mosley might have been losing his footing a little bit. Johnson was running a quarter route. Didn't get out of his break very well because he was being held by a defender. Brooks on the handoff, hit by Hunt. And here's the previous play, Kel. And I don't know that it could have been on Mosley. He's the safety, and I don't know that he would have been the offender here. Okanye, I think, was the, was the one that grabbed Johnson out of the break. Yeah, the Wake Forest transfer, it looked like. Anyway, it is a first down, then the two-yard run, second and eight. Each coach looking for his first Big Ten win. Brom and Fleck. Rhoda on the roll. Incomplete for Wozniak at 6-10. It's third down coming up. Well defended by Purdue. It was the boot off of that fly sweep action that we've seen Minnesota run to try to get to the edge. And Rhoda boots outside. And typically you have three routes coming from the opposite side of the field. One in the flat short and a kind of an intermediate route going out. And then a deep route. And all of them were very well covered by Purdue. Third down and eight. Rhoda just 18 yards, but the two scores on third down. They boot him again. Ezechuku and Miles see him run by, and Rhoda stretches out. They're going to have him just short. He's going to be about a quarter of a yard short of the marker with the knee down as he got belted by Neal. you got to go, right? Yeah, you do. I think Minnesota has to get something done. They have some rhythm on this drive, and they've actually been establishing things on the line of scrimmage quite well early in this one. Purdue's a little disorganized. Fourth down and one. Smith on the carry into the pile, and the first marker from the far side official looks like first down, and it is. Yeah, I think both officials coming in from either side had him getting basically to the 50, which is exactly where he needed to gain. Minnesota now six for six on fourth down for the year. Smith out, Brooks in. They lean on the run. Blitz coming. Rhoda backpedaling incomplete. Closest guy was Marcus Bailey, the linebacker. And this crowd, which actually was evacuated from the stadium because of weather, is getting fairly loud again. Yeah, they're getting into it. And I, I think they would like their quarterback, Rhoda, to set his feet a little better. He has a bad habit of drifting backwards on his throws, and he comes up short, and that's typically the reason why. There was a receiver open, and Rhoda is drifting backwards and just throws it into this wet grass. Second down. Brooks finds another seam. 
And he's going to set up third down and four. Thieneman and Bailey collaborated on the tackle. What's your call here, Kelly Stopper? More of the same. I think I, I like the way the line of scrimmage is working, both in pass protection and in the run game. Rhoda has looked good out on the edge in the pass game, whether he throws it or whether he keeps it. Third down and four, likely two down territory. Smith tunneling forward. This will be fourth down at about a yard and a half. Wilson clubbed him down, and here we go. That play call would tell me it was going to be fourth down, and that's typically what happens to play callers. Their head coach comes up and says, you have two to get this one, and so it influences the third down call. You run the zone up inside, and you get to third and, I mean, fourth and pretty manageable right here, but I think Minnesota is certainly going to take a timeout and think this over. Timeout, Minnesota, they're first. Timeout on Fleck. the field. Wants to talk it over. Two timeouts left for the Gophers. They have the ball, fourth and one on the other side. Dakota does have an accomplished kicker, Emmett Carpenter, who is 22 for 24 last year. Six for nine this season coming in. Will it come down to his leg? We'll find out. Coverage is streaming live on the ESPN app. Download now and take ESPN everywhere. Third down, Minnesota. Emmett Carpenter, their kicker, his career long is 53 yards away. So it's up to Rhoda and the offense to try to grab at least a couple more yards. It's 54 and a half or so from here. Minnesota on third down. Brooks got a block from Lingen on the outside, and Brooks leans forward to the marker. It is a first down, Minnesota, four and a half to go. The fly sweep motion once again, and Purdue just continues to get out leveraged out on the edge. By now, when Brooks goes in motion, on that fly sweep, you should anticipate that he has a high probability of getting the ball, but it's the extra effort by Shannon Brooks at the end to get over that line to gain. I would say that he might have been a little bit short, but there's no stoppage coming. And the run for Smith. So again, remember that the yellow line is not 100% locked in accurate. So very close on that last play. Minnesota continues with the ball, and again, their eighth in FBS in time of possession. They're used to this stuff. Yeah, and you not only picking up that first down, you get to choose some clock, which is obviously very important. But it also, if you settle for a field goal, Emmett Carpenter is a lot more comfortable now than he was at that 54 and a half yard mark. 15th play of the drive coming for Minnesota. And a whistle and a timeout. P.J. Fleck was hustling down the sideline trying to get a timeout. He had the boat running full steam he ahead. 4-3-40 on that one. Soda has had the ball since the weather delay ended and trying to get in the field goal range of Emmett Carpenter. They're there right now, but again, soggy field, yeah. windy day, who knows? All bets are off. There isn't any doubt. Minnesota fully intends to get this into the end zone. And maybe never let Purdue see the ball. Yeah, the best of both worlds would be to burn clock and get a touchdown. Smith on the delay. Third down and manageable for the 21 coming up. When do you start to use those timeouts if you're Purdue? I think about any time you're approaching three minutes. So probably after this play, for sure, if Minnesota picks up a first down, it's a no-brainer to start burning them. You have no choice. Third down and four.
surely Minnesota has to run this again. They do. Smith turned away. I think Jeff Brom is going to choose to use one now. Fourth down, you don't want those precious seconds to burn off the time clock out. before this field goal attempt. I think that's a really good use of first. his first time out. Although, time out. the counter argument is if Minnesota misses this field goal, you'd really like to have the time run off the clock that you just saved. But you don't know. Yeah, you don't know. I think you're playing kind of the percentages, looking at the probability of this ball going through. And so you, you play kind of almost worst case scenario. If we end up behind here, we want the most clock we can possibly have and still have a couple of timeouts. Chris Button. Guys, I've been watching Carpenter. He's a bit nervous. He's been pacing down the sidelines, closing his eyes, trying to breathe, clinching his fists a lot. We'll see. Game's on the line. Green Bay's finest, Emmett Carpenter from 38. Carpenter. Good! Remember, Purdue earlier had a missed extra point. point. Yeah, great point. This was true. This was right down the middle. Struck very confidently by Emmy Carpenter. And if you're P.J. Fleck, you've seen your team whittle down about seven minutes plus of clock. I, if that's not current gopher football, I don't know what it is. Yeah, that is exactly not only current gopher ball, but maybe as long as P.J. Fleck is there, possess the ball, be aggressive and physical on the line of scrimmage and then timely pass game and do special teams really well. Emmett Carpenter was that guy on this drive. He made from 52 and 53 against Purdue last year. This one from 38 to cap a seven and a half minute drive. Santoso slips as he kicks it away. Knox from the one. He had a touchdown earlier. Knox along the sideline. He's across the 40. Santoso had to get up and knock him down. Tonight, after Cal and Washington on ESPN, Stan Verrett and Linda Cohn have Sports Center at night. All the highlights from college football, the NLDS. Cubs and Nationals, NFL News, and much more. Sports Center at night, also live on the ESPN app. So it's up to the sophomore out of the state of Kentucky, Elijah Sindelar, who didn't start the game, but he's had the controls of the offense since drive number four. Markel Jones gets the carry. Two timeouts left for Purdue. And remember, Purdue moves with the purpose most of the time anyway. They're, they're not a mock seven type of offense, but they certainly get after it in terms of getting to the line of scrimmage and go again. Over the middle, he's got the tight end, Bryson Hopkins, his first grab into plus territory, gain of six. 145 to go and moving. Remember, Purdue's kicking situation is not exactly airtight. They trade off kickers every kick. We'll see who it even might be in the case of a game winner. Sindelar over the middle on a cross. Mahungu inside the 20 yard line. Huff chased him out and Purdue is set up. And one of the staples of this pass game in Purdue by Jeff Brom is the mesh play. You see crossing routes in the middle. Mahungu comes out the other side and it's up to the quarterback to sort out where the opening is. And that time, Sindelar did just that right on time and on target.
Jones on the run. Cuts inside. Touchdown, Purdue! Back from injury at a big time, Markel Jones. Now do you go for two? Yeah, you definitely have to go for two right here. They will go for two. After a drive that lasted 109. Sindelar to make it a seven point game. He's got it. Phillips, 24 17. Trips to the right and essentially a rub route. The inside receivers or the outside receivers give room for the inside receiver to essentially rub off of their routes. And then Sindelar puts a BB on the chest of Phillips. You told us earlier the mesh route is the absolute core play, anchor play for Purdue in the past game, and they just used it in a big way. Yeah, Mahungu was the one. They're crossing routes, and he's going to come from the left to the right, and he's basically going to get a pick route or a rub by the opposite crosser. And you see the defender was trailing him, and there was absolutely nothing the defender could do because the mesh is literally shoulder to shoulder, and then Markel Jones pays it off. Well-executed two-point conversion as well. You can see the inside receivers creating room, and then Phillips goes to the flat, and Sindelar puts a BB on it. So Purdue, the school with the locomotive as a mascot, goes in in 69 seconds after Minnesota rode the boat for 17 plays and seven and a half minutes. That epitomizes both offenses in these programs currently. Touchback once again for Spencer Evans, and now it falls upon Connor Rhoda, the redshirt senior, out of Creighton Durham Hall, the highly thought of school in Minnesota, to try to get him back down for a tying touchdown. Well, and Jason, you mentioned it on that methodical long drive, and Minnesota ends up getting a field goal out of it to go ahead. They burned two timeouts. When you, we questioned whether they needed to do that or not, well, now they would certainly like to have those timeouts back, but I think on that drive, it was more imperative to have your ducks in a row and have the right play call. Rhoda's only completed eight passes today. Rolling out. He has a completion to Lingen. Out of bounds across the 30. Stops the clock, 110 to go. And Rhoda is much better on the move as far as I can tell. I would launch the pocket one direction or the other, cut the field in half, and see if you can get a big body tight end hooking up to gain some more yardage. Second down. Nice pickup by Smith to free Rhoda up to run for the first down. Clock moving with the ball spotted. Under a minute. Ezechuku got dragged down. Rhoda unloads it out of bounds. Carter was closest. Miles had some pressure. 49 seconds to go. A lot of time off there. Yeah, that was about 14 seconds of an unproductive pass route. The quick pressure forced the quarterback Rhoda out, but it was well covered on the back end by Purdue. Second down, Minnesota forced to pass the ball. 
Rhoda. That is caught. Oh my goodness, Rashad still off the deflection gives Minnesota a pulse. An amazing catch. The defender almost has this. Does that ball get to the ground? Devon Hunt actually maybe should have picked that thing off. He didn't get up quite high enough and then still does a great job of keeping his eye on it, catches it the second time. I think this is a catch from the look that we saw in that quick replay. I agree. I think Steele came down Pulling with his on ball. on the field was a completed catch. Plays under further review. Dewan Hunt kind of mistimes his jump just a little bit, and he actually went through his hands. He probably should have had it, but then still doesn't get it initially. I think his arms are under it at the end. I think that's going to be a catch. Remember, the indisputable video evidence is necessary. It was called a completion on the field. Didn't have it there, but then I believe he gets his arms under it. What do you think, Jason? I think it's a catch, and I think Rashad still gets a little vindication after a late offensive pass interference call against Maryland in their last game. That's a catch. Dewan Hunt had that covered. And you can see he mistimed his jump and didn't actually get vertical as much as he went off to the right, giving still an opportunity to catch that football. Beautiful concentration for the junior out of El Paso who began his football career as a high school junior, Rashad Still. So now you still have that one timeout left if you're Minnesota on the 32-yard line needing a touchdown and a point after to tie this game up. So now when do you use that typically in this situation after a big play or a play that you think a lot of time is going to run off the clock? You certainly have to use it, and then you just live without one the rest of the game. After review, the ruling on the field is confirmed. Completed catch, first down. Not even stands, confirmed as a catch, so he did bring it in. That was a 32-yard grab. Minnesota has 43 seconds to get 32 more yards. Clock goes. Rhoda. Pressure comes, and incomplete. Ty Johnson had some green grass in front of him. Second down, 36 seconds. Purdue electing to try to get pressure with four, cover with seven, and Purdue has been fairly successful at getting pressure on Rhoda, at least making him move his feet a little bit. You would wonder once again if Rhoda's best chance to throw the ball down the field is by changing the launch point, getting him outside the pocket. You cannot afford a sack right here. Second down. As a Chuku coming. He almost got there. This is a jump ball. Incomplete. Smiley, the redshirt freshman, was closest for Purdue. Third down. And Mark Williams, the re intended receiver, does a great job of turning into a defensive back and swatting that ball away at the end. Rhoda was not outside the pocket. That ball needed to go to an intended receiver or go out of bounds, and he didn't quite get it out of bounds. Third down, 10. Smith on the dump down. And he's out of bounds. So now the chains are the enemy. It's fourth down, Minnesota. 23 seconds to go. What's your play call here? Yeah, the chains are the enemy. The clock at this point in time doesn't matter because you can call a timeout. But I still like the fact that Rhoda is best on the move. I probably move him into the trips, and they have to get to the 22-yard line. Run pass option out to the triple side where the receivers are at the top of the screen. Rhoda, game on the line, intercepted Bentley, Jawan Bentley on his way to a victory for Purdue, touchdown!
He missed the first half. He was saving it all up after the targeting penalty two weeks ago. And Bentley is a senior and has a lot of experience, and he's just staring down the quarterback. You can see him at the top of the screen, and he knows a route is coming in behind him. Squeeze it. If you're, the quarterback's eyes take you there, and the veteran, Bentley, does that, and then more importantly, he finishes the play. Gets the ball in his hands, and then gets into the end zone. A spectator for the first half, the game winner in the second half. Dellinger's extra point is good. Bentley did a great job of reading the route and reading the quarterback's eyes kind of in unison. He catches the route out of it, the corner of his eyes after the, the head and eyes of the quarterback took him to that side to begin with, and the veteran knew what that meant, and he made the most of it. For a guy whose coaches say he's the gregarious one, he has great people skills, team leader type, and Jeff Rahm was very honest with us. He said, coming in, I had heard maybe up down about Bentley sometimes, maybe when things get tough. He said he has been just an outstanding citizen, a great player for our team, and in Purdue's first game, after the passing of Joe Tiller, it's the defense that puts it away. The offense did That's enough. It's a good point. And for Coach Tiller, it's a 14-point lead for the Boilermakers late. Ten seconds for a miracle for the Gophers. McCrary on the return. And six seconds to play for Jeff Braum and a Purdue team that was 9-39 and 39 the last four seasons. This is a moment to get your first Big Ten win. What's your takeaway if you're the head coach on that Purdue sideline? Well, I think it's, it's exactly that. What goes into learning how to win? It is a learned practice. It doesn't happen by accident. I mean, whether it's a high school softball team in Nebraska like my daughter's team today at Shadron High School, learn how to win. You get put in these moments and you have to make plays. Who's going to make, make them? Don't look around for someone else to do it. Shadron High School is champions tonight, and Purdue's learning how to win games in this particular conference. All good stuff. The light show begins. Jeff Brom will celebrate with his Boilermakers. 31-17, your final score for Chris Button, Kelly Stauffer, and our entire crew, Jason Benetti. ESPN goal line is next. Matt Schick has it for you. Purdue by 14. Matty, take it away.